Revelation chapter 3, as you turn there. <clears throat> who, who heard about this week the government was ordered by a bill from Congress um, signed by the president, President Trump actually. They were ordered by June of this year to release and compile a report on their knowledge of unknown, they change the name every so often, unknown aerospace phenomenon. Do you read that story? Uh, it was, it sounded like a five-year-old tri child trying to come up with a good story so they wouldn't get in trouble. That's what it sounded like to me. There was an admittance, there was an admittance that they know that there have been intrusions into Earth's airspace, the United States airspace, of uh, vehicles whose performances they cannot explain. Like the fact that they just can go from zero to 1,200 miles an hour without accelerating. That they can cloak themselves, appear and disappear at will. They can show up on radar or not show up on radar, but can be seen by pilots. There was one, um, a country in South America, was uh, some jets were scrambled because there was a report of a UAP, a UFO, in their airspace, and the pilot kept flipping from video to uh, infrared on video he couldn't see a thing in other words with the naked eye they couldn't see a thing when he flipped it on infrared it would show up meaning it had the ability to cloak itself from our eyesight but when we detected infrared there was this thing there floating and it was emitting something into the air it was like weird stuff they had no idea what it was <clears throat> so the government, once again, trying not to admit anything, uh, just saying that, yes, uh, our pilots have seen something. We now have a program in place for our pilots to be able to report this because we have commercial airline pilots, private pilots, especially the commercial pilots and the military pilots who see these things every day and they're told, are you going to report this? And they're going, are you kidding me? I'll lose my job for this. I'll lose my pension for this. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. This has been going on for years. Project Blue Book was something that the Air Force came up with to try to cover up as much of it as they possibly could for the American public. And the reason why I'm saying this is, number one, number one it is relevant. It is highly relevant. Wh whatever you believe about it, it's highly relevant. Um, the Watchman broadcast that's coming out today is the beginning of a series uh, that I'm going to do. It's based upon Matthew 24. When Jesus said, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon shall not give her light, the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken, and the stars are going to fall from the heavens. And for years, that didn't make sense to me, because I'm thinking that must be a meteor shower or something, because stars are great big things, and if they were to fall to the earth, they would burn the earth up. Uh, besides that, they're 100 million miles, uh, light years away. How would they ever be able to do that? And um, so anyway, um, but then after you read the Bible, you find out that stars are not just what scientists say they are. They are the, of the angelic realm. They are the appearances of what we can see of angels. And the, God is going to take a third of them and cast them down here to this earth. 
And that, that day is going to be the beginning of what everybody says the new world order is going to be. There will definitely be a new world order on that day. And uh, so you're going to hear a lot of that uh, coming out in the news. Now that news, mainstream news companies are actually reporting these things now because the New York Times let it out a few years ago. You're going to be hearing a lot about this. You're going to be hearing about it from me. Uh, maybe not so much here, uh, but what I do upstairs, you're going to be hearing a lot about that. That's why we're going to Las Vegas uh, in, at the end of August um, because we have a booth and we're going to give away thousands of DVDs at a mutual UFO network conference that's being held out there. Brother George, it's all military speakers, former Department of Defense, former um, pilots, uh, the USS Nimitz radar technician who first spotted what they call the Tic Tac UFO, said the thing was at 80,000 feet and in a second it dropped down to sea level. And he got it on radar. And he was just stunned. Well, guess what happened to, the, to his radar tapes? He's responsible for those radar tapes. He has, to, he has to sign a log. He has to store them. He is, he is responsible for those tapes. And if those tapes get lost, he gets court-martialed. Well, some guys in suits landed a helicopter on the USS Nimitz, questioned him for hours, took his tapes. No authorization, no authority. The captain just said, let him have the tapes. Those tapes are gone now. The proof that that hack happened, <clears throat> the only proof we have is a little bit of uh, flare, flare, forward looking infrared that one of the pilots took. So, anyway, all right, Revelation chapter 3, enough of that. We moved on. Let me, um, let me do this, let me finish reading about the church of Thyatira we dealt a lot with Jezebel and everything about her and I want to I want you to look in verse 21 and we'll see how Jezebel ends up here it's not going to be good I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not if God gives you a chance to repent of something if I were you I'd do it while you're still breathing God's air and you know you've committed a sin and the devil will tell you, well, God's not going to forgive you anymore because you've already done this a thousand times and he's, he's, got, he's not going to forgive you. If the devil's telling you that, God's not. He's given you space to repent. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. I believe God is faithful and just. Amen. I believe God will do what he said he'd do. So he said, I will... I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed with them that commit adultery with her, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That pastor that I talked about here a few months ago, that was leading a double life, him and his wife, and another man meeting up in, in hotel rooms across town. And then his wife arranged for him to be killed by the other guy. And the other guy came into the house one night with this pastor's own gun, shot him in the head while he was asleep. That there should be a wake-up call to every pastor, every pastor's wife, every deacon every church layman that should be a wake-up call that Jesus Christ always knows what goes on outside of the church inside of the church he always knows what happens and if you don't repent he will deal with you publicly everybody now knows this guy's sins everybody knows it now he stood before God I am not the man's judge but everybody on this earth now knows this man and his wife's sins. He preached the church. I think she's saying in the, uh, 
in the uh, worship band made out like everything was fine but they were all in threesome adultery that had been going on for months and who knows what had been going on before that and he said I will give every one of you according to your works verse 23 verse 24 but unto you I say and unto the rest of Thyatira as many as have not known this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak I will put upon you none other burden but that which you already hold fast, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. That means don't let these things that you believe go. Don't fall after the manner of what's going on around you. Stay off the internet. Quit believing everything you read on there. You, believe, you read your Bible more now and everything else less. You do that. Hold these things fast. Um, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He's talking about us as the church. This is interesting to me. Notice that he says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. In, <clears throat> in um, Revelation 12, you have a woman giving birth to a man-child. We, we know that to be Christ. It's a, uh, and this man-child is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that is written in the Psalms. It's a prophecy from the Psalms. Well, looky here. He says in verse 26, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. That exact passage is written in the Psalms of Christ. <clears throat> and when you look at this, you see that it's not just Christ who comes to rule over the nations. He brings the ten thousands of his saints with him, which I believe is us who have been translated into heaven to be with Jesus. We now have our new glorified bodies. We cannot be tempted. We cannot be bribed. We cannot, we will not fear the faces of men. We will judge the earth in perfect righteousness. When he says he shall rule them with a rod of iron, why not a, why not a rod of gold? Kings carry a scepter of gold. Gold's nice and it's expensive, but what is gold? What can you do easily with gold that you can't do with iron? Bend it. Gold, listen, you, there's, a, there's a powerful lesson in there. Gold bends judgment. Doesn't it? How many, think, how many judges do you think are on the take in this country? Ruled by money. Ruled by power and influence. Judge, giving judgment to the rich and powerful that they won't give to the poor. Gold bends. Rods of iron don't. That means the law written in stone is what we'll be ruling by and it's either did you did it or did you not did it. It's that simple. And if you did it, there's going to be a consequence. If you didn't do it, you, then you're free from it. But the earth will be ruled for a thousand years by Christ and, and by those who have endured faithful to the end. Faithful, meaning full of faith. You've kept the faith into the end. You've kept the works of Christ into the end. The works of Christ, not the works of yourself, not the works of man, but the works of Christ unto the end. And God shall give us a rod of iron to rule over the nations with. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. That's Christ. That's the sun coming up in the morning. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, the church of Sardis, unto the angel of the church, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Sardis, write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What did we say the seven stars were? They were the seven churches. Think about the sun from the earth perspective. And this is how the Bible always draws it. There is the earth and the heavens. 
And there's a, in, in the Bible, there's a difference between them. Not counting the earth, you have seven other planets that are surrounding the sun. The sun is in the midst of the seven stars, just like John wrote in Revelation chapter 1, from the perspective of the earth. And these seven stars are the seven churches. So, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Now, I've been told by people that we have a dead church. <clears throat> and they've said that because we don't clap during the singing. We don't get up and dance, wave our arms. We don't shout a lot. When we have altars of prayer, not everybody's trying to yell out loud their prayer to overpray somebody else. I've been told we're dead. The difference between a living church and a dead church is are they still standing? Are they still standing? Are they still faithful unto the end? A live church and a dead church has nothing to do with the motions or the fair showing in the flesh. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. You can have churches that are even more formal in their worship than we are. I don't really consider ourselves formal in our worship. I try to go how the spirit leads I, I may even from time to time ask what do you, if you got a song to sing let's sing it um, so I try not to be too stuck I was taught in Bible college I took a class on church music and was told never to ask the congregation what to sing well I'm breaking the rules okay <clears throat> so I figured well why not maybe they want to sing something it's yeah it was it was I'm telling you it was a rule and um, and I it was on the test too and uh, I was taught how to do this even though I knew how to do it already but I found out it wasn't holding my hand quite right it had to be sh shaped a certain way uh, yeah they taught me all that stuff and so anyway um, but it, that has no, that has nothing to do the loudness of the service, the beating of the drums, the excitement of the music, or the emotional drama that the, sometimes the music can produce, that has absolutely nothing to do with whether a church is alive or dead. Nothing. Is that church still standing on the promises of God? Do they still believe in walking down the old paths? Do they still believe the word of God? Do they still stand on these precious promises and are not going to be moved away from them? They are still alive. And there's still plenty of them. They're going away, but there's plenty of them. There are churches. See, here's what happens. The power that a church needs does not come from the guitars, the lights, the fog machines, the, the piano players, the praise band. It doesn't come from the dynamic um, life coach lessons of the pastorette. It doesn't come from any old things. The power that belongs in a church comes solely from the Word of God. Solely from the Word of God. But see, what's happened is, because they've removed the Word of God from the churches, they, have, they replace it with a pseudo-power. They replace it with what looks like the beginning of a uh, pep rally for a, base, or for a basketball game or a football game. They get the crowd pumped up. They get them worked up. I've watched enough praise and worship services to know that they have, a, they have a, a, a form that they follow. The first songs, in order to, when they go there, 
The first songs they play are loud. The drums are going. The, everybody's standing up, clapping, shouting, waving their hands. And as the music progresses, then it slows way down. This is done on purpose. They begin to slow the music down. And what that does is that it, once the adrenaline is going, now we're going to pump that way down and we're going to cause everybody to lull their minds down. And then once that they have gotten their minds and their bodies and tears are running down their eyes and they're all swaying with the soft music, they're told very quietly to sit down. The pastor comes out immediately with his lesson. Okay? He has got their minds focused on his soft... It's almost like hypnotism. You'll never see them break from the music to give announcements, take up an offering. You'll never see... Listen, I've studied these things. You'll never see these things happen. It goes right from the music right into the pastor now soothing them with calm words. Okay? That's not power. That's a replacement. It is a replacement. Everything that modern churches do now are a replacement for the real power of God that gives us life. The Word of God is not only itself alive, it gives life. Amen to that. But Jesus said, I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest. Everybody goes to that church because they like the music of that church. I've had people tell me, Pastor, we, you know, it's a good church, but we go to that church over here because their music, we like their music. Number one thing, we like their music. What's that got to do with anything? My house should not be called, a, my, my house should be called a house of music. Is that what he said? House of prayer. This church is dead. And Jesus told them so. If Jesus, and Jesus doesn't have to mince his words. He doesn't have to say it nicely. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's the head of the church. And if he says you're not doing right. Then you're not doing right. Be watchful. He says. And uh, strengthen the, th the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. This is why they're dead. <clears throat> Sin. If there's anything that Genesis chapter 2 and 3 teaches us. Is that where there is sin, there's going to be death. Ephesians 2 verse 1 and you have he quickened which means be made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins we all used to be dead when we were in our sins but now that he has quickened us he's made us alive and um, I used to I, I was going to say when you go to work where you work, when you walk in the building, you know, when people say, hi, how are you doing? I'm loving my job, man. This job is the greatest job in the whole world. I wouldn't work anywhere else. They didn't even have to pay me to come here. You don't do that. And I knew a guy in Bible college. Fakest, most phony guy I ever met in my life. Because you never got... A regular straight answer out of this guy I would just simply ask him hey Jamie how you doing the answer is hey I'm all right how's it going it's just a, it's just a greeting but every time you talk to this guy Jamie how's it going Jesus brother I'm spreading his word and I'm not exaggerating he never said a word but what he boasted about what he did all the time and I'm going, you're as fake as they come. I didn't like the guy. I didn't like him. I stayed away from him. So that doesn't mean that you're dead. That you don't do that. 
every place you show up and every time you do something. You're dead because, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Prince of the power of the air. The word Beelzebub is, in the Old Testament, Beelzebub. Baal means Lord. And Zebub is the word for flies, flying creatures. Okay? Spirits, in other words. Yeah, it could be regular flies. God afflicted the, Israel, uh, the Egyptians with flies. But I always, I always, anything with wings to me is showing you it has a spiritual aspect to it. There is a spirit that he doesn't just rule over house flies. He rules over spirits that haunt us, that are around us all the time. Satan cannot do everything by himself. God, however, can. God does not need help. He uses it to show favor, I guess, to, to bless people with. But he does not need our help and he does not need the angel's help. Satan, however, can't get by without it. So he is the prince of the power of the air. Anything, any spirit that flies, he is in charge of. And he uses those spirits against us every day. When we were lost, we walked according to those spirits. Whatever those spirits told us to do, that's what we did. And by the way, where do you fly? Where do you find flies on? Stink. The dead. That's, think about it. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Beelzebub, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Why? Because they're dead. And when flies find dead things, what are they doing there? Laying maggots. Okay? So there'll be more of them. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's what we lived for. This is what we spent our waking hours and our dream times. This is how we spent our lives. We spent our lives looking for more sin. Now we spend our lives trying to fight it off as much as possible because we hate it. There's a difference in us now. We're alive. We're fighters. Um, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, like Lazarus. There was flies all over Lazarus. I guarantee you there was. <clears throat> and, he, and what did the, what did his sister say when Jesus said, take ye away the stone? Surely he stinketh. They did not want that. And uh, I heard a good sermon on that. That's family members ashamed of another family member. And they don't, they say pray for my family member or so-and-so, but they really don't want them around. Because they stink. Their sins stink. But who's the best people in the world to bring back to life again? The people that are dead. Okay? The people who are dead and know it. And by the way, what do dead people do? Nothing. And by four days, I can tell you, nothing's alive. God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins... Hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through G Christ Jesus. If they call you dead now, just wait. Just wait. Because one of these days... They're going to see who really was alive in Christ and who wasn't. And it's not going to have anything to do with how they did their praise and worship or how they danced 
or how loud they talked about Jesus and how much they bragged about what they did and didn't do. It would be because they followed God in faith and trust. Then at verse 7, In the ages to come, you might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And again, Anybody wants to pass judgment on our church, they're more than welcome to it. But God will manifest the deeds and the faith of this church in His judgment day. And it is before God we will either stand or fall for the things that we both believed, the things that we stood on, and the things that we let God do through us. I wouldn't say the things that we did, because clearly we didn't do them. God did them through us, and that's how it always works. And <clears throat> who decides in my body, what part of my body decides the movements of the body? Is it my finger? It's the head. The head is the one that tells the body. There was a a uh, contemporary Christian song that came out back years ago uh, it was real popular for a while and it said if we are the body why aren't his feet moving why aren't his hands working and that sounds real spiritual but when you begin to think about it if you know the Bible then what that song is about is it's blaming God for not moving the body the body doesn't move without the head telling it to move if we are of his body we move according <coughs> excuse me we move and do according to God's will not what man says not what man expects but what God tells us to do and let's say there's a church that all they do God has them praying is is that enough if it's if it's of God and he's telling them to do it it's absolutely what God wants them to do. What if there's a church that all they do is soul witness and hand out tracts? If that's what God has them doing, that's what God has them doing. My brother Tim Barron's, that's his whole life. And that's what he does. And he is cut out for that. I, I do not know another person personally that has the love for sinners that he has. And I know his life, I know even some things that he's told me in days gone by that he used to do. He's a sinner just like the rest of us. But God has him doing that. Now God doesn't have everybody doing that, but he has him doing it. He's alive, we're alive, if we remain faithful, saved by grace, not by works. We are the workmanship of Christ. And what God tells us to do, I guarantee you, if we are God's church, we're going to end up doing it. And no man can put a stop to it. Amen? Amen. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, we understand what you said to this church in Sardis. They had a name that they were alive, and whatever the reason was, whatever this church made everybody in the community think about themselves you knew the difference you knew that they were dead in trespasses and in sins there's no telling what was going on in this church and amongst its people and probably even its pastor and God you were not happy with this this is your body and if, if my right hand was dead and infected <clears throat> and threatened to kill the rest of the body, wouldn't hesitate to cut it off. And Father, that's what we know. You promise to it, all of these churches. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to take your candlestick out of the candle. 
And Father, help us, dear God, to take wisdom from this. To remain faithful to your word. To trust your word. To stand on your word. And to wait for your calling. Wait for you to move in us. Wait for you to do the works in us that should be done. And not let anybody judge us about what they think we should be doing or not be doing. It is not our place to judge another church, another man's servant. It is not anybody else's place to judge us. Father, we wait as a servant, ready for you to call. Help us, dear God, to be faithful stewards, faithful servants, looking to our master for you to call us into obedience, for you to move in us and trust in us, God, what you want done. And bless us, Father, as we do it. Whether we're rewarded here, that's fine. But if our reward has to wait, Father, it's better that way anyway. Continue to bless this church. I love this church. And I love what you have done in this church. And this church spread abroad throughout the entire world. I love what you have done, Heavenly Father. Continue to do that in each and every one of us. Help us as, as servants to look to your hand to show us what to do next. And we'll wait for that. We'll trust in you. Bless your word in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.